So uh, we have our Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor K.R. Sambasivara, uh, who is the key uh, person behind organizing these uh, webinars in uh, Mizoram University and uh, uh, identifying the resource persons from across the world in different branches of uh, science, arts, engineering, and management. So uh, we are very much privileged here to have our uh, three uh, speakers who are uh, the inter international researchers on cancer biology and uh, those who have been, uh, I mean, associated with Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. So in this webinar today, uh, we are going to have, as I mentioned, three speakers. So the first speaker is going to be uh, Pale Kumar, uh, who is uh, uh, the associate professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Biochemistry in uh, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. Uh, and uh, also two of his colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Manisha Tripathi and uh, Dr. Srinivas Nandana. So welcome you all, and it's a great privilege to have you three, uh, three lead speakers here in this conference, which is going to enrich the participants and also the faculty and researchers across the world on uh, cancer biology and the, in general, uh, the translational research and the kind of research that is happening in uh, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. So uh, to begin with the first speaker, uh, Dr. Pale Kumar. Uh, so his research interests um, is focused on understanding the molecular mechanisms of carcinogenesis and uh, also to develop uh, preventive and therapeutic interventions for different malignant and other diseases by basic and translational research. Uh, the focus of his research group uh, is uh, on basic science research projects focused on understanding the complex interplay between tumor suppressors and oncogenes in genome maintenance and the mutations or their uh, deregulations in carcinogenesis and uh, tumor development. So he works on, uh, his team works on DNA damage response and repair signaling uh, genes. Um, and uh, he, they are also focusing on the mutations in the genes that cause genome instability, cancer predisposition syndromes, uh, like the uh, breast and ovarian cancer early onset, uh, Fanconi anemia. And uh, they also work on uh, the resistance to chemo and radiation therapy, by studying the altered regulations of cell cycle checkpoints and DNA repair networks. So the, his research team employs multidisciplinary approaches to identify gene regulatory networks and cell signaling mechanisms. The other areas are on the translational research projects focused on genetic and epigenetic mechanisms that tumor cells adapt to survive from oncogenic replication stress uh, and also from the uh, radio and chemotherapy. So uh, their goal is to identify key regulators of these complex networks in tumor cells and uh, develop rationally designed therapeutic combinations uh, to effectively uh, kill the tumor cells. So he has been involved in many of the research projects on uh, synthetic lethality approaches to treat ovarian and breast cancers, ubiquitin signaling and epigenetic reprogramming uh, of tumor metabolism and therapeutic re relapse, and also on uh, hedgehog uh, signaling mediated regulations of uh, repair genes uh, during the process of carcinogenesis and to understand the oxidative stress and altered estrogen metabolism in cancer and neurological disorders. So uh, he has uh, publications in uh, many of uh, the international leading uh, journals in, on cancer, so including Neoplasia in uh, translational cancer research in Journal of Breast Cancer, Molecular Carcinogenesis, bioorganic and medicinal chemistry letters, on-code target, and also uh, in a few other journals like Cancers, uh, JBC, PLOS One. So he has been uh, involved in extensive research in these areas. So uh, incidentally, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar uh, is a, uh, the student of our Honorable Vice Chancellor in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the, during his PhD time. Uh, in the in Nagarjuna University, and uh, he has been uh, having a long association with our Honorable Vice Chancellor, and we once again thank him for organizing this webinar uh, through the research team of uh, Dr. Kumar and his colleagues. So uh, welcome, sir, and uh, uh, we request you to uh, start your uh, talk. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sentil Kumar. And uh, actually, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Samshara, sir, uh, for kindly inviting and uh, sharing with uh, 
sharing with you our research projects. And uh, yeah, it's like Naivas, he's a biotech student, uh, uh, MSc biotechnology student at Nagar University. And uh, he has been uh, like, you know, uh, like you know, great to help and encourage us in getting into the, the right career. And uh, uh, like, you know, all of our batch people are like you know, in very good positions so because of him. Uh, so I think he's doing the same hard work there and uh, he's the go-getter uh, kind of personality. And I'm sure uh, you can see uh, so many webinars in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Northeastern University. So that I, I'm pleased to see all these developments and, uh, and also getting to know you all. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. So I'm going to share this, uh, my screen. Can you see the slideshow? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Good. Yeah, first, uh, actually, I would like to uh, talk about today about two projects. Uh, so one is uh, basically the drug discovery project. And uh, the second project will be more on the mechanisms and uh, and synthetically therapy based uh, approach. How we actually can design the combination therapies uh, for the cancer therapy. So these two projects, I, I may like probably I may take a little few few more minutes, but I will try to be uh, within the thirty minutes time. So this is my current uh, research group, and uh, so uh, like no, so most of the work uh, that I am going to show is. Uh, is about uh, like you know, everything is done by my students or the postdocs. And uh, so all the credit goes to my people. So if we look into uh, like you no know, different kind of cancers, uh, you know, we get affected by many uh, different organs of ours, uh, get cancer and, uh, and uh, like you know, we have different outcomes for each one uh, due to the availability of the therapeutics. If we look into the common cancers like uh, lung cancer, you have uh, targets like EGFR and VEGF, and there are targeted therapeutics like cetuximab or bevacizumab. And uh, so they actually uh, uh, like we increase the lifespan of the people uh, significantly. Similarly, th that you will be hearing more about this, uh, this cancer, about prostate cancer. Yeah, you have uh, the, uh, the target as a testosterone biases or androgen biases. Uh, pathways and there are availability of the drugs for that. And so, uh, so since uh, 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 Dr. Tripathi and Dr. Nandana will be talking more, I will not uh, talk much about here. And also the breast cancer, which is the most common cancer uh, affected women. Uh, so the, and there are um, uh, different kind of subtypes uh, based on the receptors they express, surface, cell surface receptors they express, like uh, estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptors, HER2 receptor. So, they, so these are the things and they have targeted therapies for those. And the only uh, the major uh, like, no, the therapeutic indolent cancers are like no, triple negative breast cancer, which is actually a subtype of the breast cancer, but they do not have any targeted therapy drugs. They do not respond to the existing therapies. Mostly the chemotherapy or the radiation is the option. Uh, another cancer is the ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is, is the most lethal cancer again. And so there, again, there is no existence of the targeted therapies or they don't respond well for those therapies. So if you look into this, uh, the molecular subtypes of the uh, triple negative breast cancer, so this is uh, the most common cancer that only affects the women, is the lumen, uh, luminal A, uh, like no, luminal B, R2 overexpressing one and basal like. So these are the, like, you know, the first three subtypes, they, either they express one of the cell surface receptor, either estrogen or R2 receptors. And uh, the, the, the last one, basal like, is the one which is the triple negative breast cancer, which do not express any of those uh, cell surface receptors or the overexpression of the R2. So we do not have any effective therapies for those. And the and the, but they only contribute to like the the only the percentage of this uh, triple negative breast cancers are only ten to twenty percent. However, the the majority of the de deaths 
uh, comes from this subtype of the cancer for the breast cancer. So uh, the, that is because of, as I mentioned, because they don't respond to the existing therapies like tomaxifen or aromatase inhibitors or, or the Herceptin. And uh, so, so the, thus the prognosis is very poor. And the second cancer that I'm going to talk is the, the ovarian cancer. So, which is uh, the most uh, uh, like you know, deadliest reproductive cancer in the women. Uh, that is because like, you know, even though uh, according to the US statistics, cancer statistics, more than 22,000 cases every year detected in the uh, in, in, in US. However, but uh, like you know, the 15,000, it contributes to 15,000 deaths. That means like you know, most of the people, 80% of the people will be dying. From the disease, so that's how that's how it's uh, most uh, lethal uh, gynecological cancer. The treatment options for these patients are particularly both uh, for the triple negative and uh, uh, and uh, the ovarian cancer. So there is a uh, like you know, some differences between the triple negative breast cancer and uh, uh, ovarian cancer because you have screening uh, methods, early detection methods. Uh, for the breast cancer, because the, the mammograms or other, uh, like you know, when you go to the the, the physician, they, they check for the women uh, frequently, and uh, and then you can actually detect them early, and and they have better prognosis. Whereas the ovarian cancer, it's difficult to detect because they are asymptomatic until the tumor goes uh, all over the intraperitoneum or the distance metastasis. You will not be able to uh, detect these uh, these cancers, and most of the early detections are happened because of the accidental uh, accidentally when they go for other kind of indications. So the therapy for these cancers are the surgical resection of the visible tumor, and then they undergo carboplatin or the taxin based uh, chemotherapy, or, and also probably some cases with the radiation, and based on the location and uh, and and the uh, and the uh, the. The size of the tumor decides all of these uh, treatment modalities. And however, the problem in the, with the ovarian cancer is uh, like you know, even though initially most of the patients uh, respond to the chemotherapy, uh, the 80 percent of the uh, people uh, will come back with, uh, with a recurrent disease. So that means the therapy relapses and, uh, and then these recurrent diseases are lethal. So you cannot cure the once the uh, ovarian cancer is recurrent. So, so they, they do not respond to any existing therapies, including the currently available immunotherapies. So if you look into the clinical course of the, of the ovarian cancer, so as I said, they are only detected at the stage three or four. Uh, that is basically like, you know, they are already metastatized. So the, the, the GVN oncologists, so they, uh, they remove the, surgically remove the tumor and they undergo the chemotherapy. The tumor disappears, uh, and then there is a watchful waiting period uh, for the recurrence. That's how the, the clinical course for this. And the prolonging, uh, the, the longer the watchful for this waiting period, uh, the better the prognosis for the patient. The shorter the waiting, like no recurrence, is, is the worst prognosis. So that uh, so this, this is also one of the clinical determinant factors. And however, whatever the, uh, like, you know, whenever the, the tumors re uh, reoccur, so they do, these recurrent tumors do not re uh, respond to any of the existing uh, chemotherapeutics or the targeted therapeutics or the immunotherapeutics. So the patient ultimately dies with the, with the widespread disease. So the major hypothesis is so far uh, is known that why the tumors become, uh, like, the, the re recurrent tumors ha happens uh, in the ovarian cancer. Uh, is because of the, like, you know, in the bulk of the tumor, a subpopulation of the cells uh, are called tumor initiating cells or the cancer stem cells. So these cancer stem cells become, uh, like, actually can stay dormant when during the therapy and they will not divide and so that they can tolerate the drug better. And also during that uh, dormant period, they also reprogram themselves and they become more resistant. And then when once the therapy is concluded, after some time, then these tumor, these cells divide, and then they actually uh, the tumor recurrence happens. Uh, that that will become a full blown disease, uh, as shown in here. So to overcome this problem, uh, our lab is focused on this uh, this as a as a major challenging task. Uh, how to address these recurrent tumors? How to treat them or, or to prevent them? 
And so we collaborated with the uh, gynecological oncologist. And here I'm showing you one of the, uh, uh, the critical person like, uh, for our projects, Mark Reedy. So we uh, system like collected the tumors from the uh, ovarian can uh, cancer patients uh, when they come to the initial diagnosis or during the surgical removal. And then after the treatment, then when the tumor recurred, uh, reoccur in these patients, we also collect collected the recurrent tumors. So we collect about like you know, 28 patients or so. And then the, the, from the primary as well as the recurrent tumors, we send it for uh, genomic analysis. So what we found out surprisingly is that the, the, the DNA repair genes and, uh, and also the cancer stem cell signaling genes are the, um, uh, the majority of them, yeah, which are significantly upregulated in the, only in the recurrent tumors, not in the primary tumors. So you can see that RAD6, which is a DNA repair engine, and uh, ALDH1A1 and SOX2, which are the cancer stem cell signaling genes. You can see these uh, like you know, five, uh, approximately five folds or two to three folds uh, increase when, 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 they, when they are compared to the, uh, the primary tumors. And uh, not only that, uh, when we look into the prognostic, va prognostic value, so the RAD6 overexpressing uh, uh, patients, uh, the progression-free survival for the two years is only 14%. Whereas RAD6 low expressing patients, they have 56% survival probability for the two years. So this means that the 14 to 56 is a huge difference. So that was actually surprising to us. And then we moved into, uh, like, you know, uh, into the lab and then see whether we can recapitulate some of these uh, the phenotypes what we observed in the patients. So what we did, we system, uh, we chose a uh, uh, chemo response, like you know, the cells that respond to carboplatin, that is uh, chemosensitive cells. And, and then we systematically, with the increased concentration of the carboplatin, we exposed them, we grew them in the carboplatin. Uh, and, and then you can see each passage, uh, and then we collected the cells and then looked into these signaling genes. Because as they are growing with the, with the uh, in, uh, in, uh, 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 in the carboplatin. So they are becoming more and more understand and, and also they are also becoming more like uh, 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 cancer stem cells, uh, cancer uh, stem cells. So you can see the increased uh, ac uh, expression of the ALDH1A1, beta catenin signaling gene, and also the SOX2 signaling gene, and also the DNA repair genes like you know, RAD6 and RAD8, they comprise as a ubiquitin ligase, and they can ubiquitinate H2B, PCNA and Fanconi anemia protein FANG-D2. So I will be showing you those uh, in, a, in a minute. And uh, then, so this could be actually recapitulated in the lab. And then also we looked into each passage of these cells, uh, their ability to form spheroids. You can see as they're becoming more and more resistant and they, they express these signaling genes and also their ability to form these cancer uh, stem cell spheroids uh, also increase the size and number of the spheroids. And also these periods overexpress RAD6, we can see the immunohistochemical you know, staining. So the hypothesis is that, like, you no, know, when during this cancer stem cell sig uh, signaling hypothesis uh, may be correct, and then we need to uh, effectively kill these uh, cancer stem cells uh, to prevent this recurrence and also the uh, improve the outcomes of these ovarian cancer patients. So for that, what we did is like whether the RAD6, the upregulated gene, most upregulated gene, could be a drug, uh, drug target. And so then we, to test that, we first, uh, like you know, the hypothesis was that if we develop RAD6 inhibitors, so the, those should be prevent, uh, like inhibiting the RAD6 mediated DNA repair signaling by uh, preventing PCNA monoepignation and FANG2 monoepignation, as well as the epigenetic changes that caused by RAD6 uh, uh, by ubiquitinating the histones, the like such as histone H2B and H2A. So these actually drive the transcription and, and stem cell signaling. This, this is the hypothesis so that we can prevent the disease recurrence. So to test this, uh, like we genetically downregulated uh, using siRNAs in the ovarian cancer cells. Uh, so here, the carboplatin treated cells, you can see uh, in this Western blood, the FANG-D2, the upper band is the monoevicinated one. When you downregulate RAD6, the, the monoevicinated band is gone. And the, similarly, with the PCNA, the upper band, the monoevicinated band is gone when you downregulate. 
and same and uh, same as the H two B ubiquitination bands. So we tested in uh, several cell lines that uh, that like you know if we uh, genetically knock down or or inhibit uh, Rad six, that could actually prevent the expression of uh, cancer stem cell signaling genes and also their ability to repair the DNA. Uh, when they are uh, treated with the chemotherapy, like such as carbapamil. So to develop the rad six inhibitors, we collaborated with the medicinal chemists. Actually, we were lucky to have a, a visiting scientist uh, from uh, University of Mysore. His name is uh, Vinaya Kambappa. Uh, he is a medicinal chemist, and he came on the this Raman Fellowship, C. Raman Fellowship, I think, to to the postdoctoral in USA. And uh, so he actually uh, did a lot of docking studies and came up with uh, several pharmacophores. And from that, we actually selected uh, at least 50 of them and we screened them and then uh, identified uh, uh, quite a few of these uh, uh, RAD6 uh, uh, inhibiting pharmacophores. And then he further uh, synthesized them, uh, like you know, there are R series and also S series uh, currently we have that are much more potent at working at the nanomolar concentration. And this uh, project is taken up by one of my graduate students, uh, Tasmin Omi. Uh, she's a, a biotech student, and then now she's the PhD student in the lab. So here you can see the UB2B nothing but is the genetic name for the RAD6 uh, enzyme. And uh, so you can see that RAD6 is, uh, RAD6 ubiquitinates the H2B, and, but, uh, but when you have this RAD6 inhibitor R14, and you can see the significant uh, inhibition of the NGM activity. And however, it's not significantly acting on the other uh, kind of the uh, ubiquitin ligases such as UB2C or UB2D. So you can see they are not much affected. So this is like you no know, more specific to the RAD6 and, uh, and, uh, and then they are working at the nanomolar concentration. And then we further tested them in the cell lines uh, and their ability to form cancer stem cell spheroids. So here you see the ovarian cancer cells, they form very good uh, three-dimensional growth, uh, like rounded uh, spheroid-like uh, structures. However, when we treat with the, uh, the, the compound S4, the, this is a RAD6 inhibitor. Uh, and uh, so uh, you can see the inhibition of their growth. And this is also dose-dependent way. You can see as we increase the dose, the, say, the, the down regulation of the, uh, their ability to form spheroid significantly down regulation. And what Tasmin did is she also tested in combination whether these RAD6 inhibitors could work in combination with the carboplatin. She used two different cell line models. One is a sensitive model, a carboplatin sensitive model, and the CP70 is a, uh, the carboplatin or cisplatin resistant uh, cell line developed. So you can see the all the positive values in this bliss energy. These are multiple combinations of each drug, uh, and then the, the, the viability tests were uh, uh, presented here. So the bliss synergy values, if they are positive, you can say that this is a synergistic. Only like you no, know, almost eighty percent of the combinations in both the cell lines. That's more interesting for us uh, are synergistic. So that Rad6 inhibitors could work synergistically with the carbon protein to overcome this cancer stem, stem signaling and also the chemo resistance. So then, uh, uh, so I'm not showing you a lot of data because of the time, and I have to move on to the next project. But for this, like you no, know, we have. Uh, lead compounds so that we are going to test in the animal models of the ovarian cancer. And so that we, if we can actually kill these cancer stem cells, we can actually have a durable response. That's what we are uh, looking into. So I will conclude this project here and I'm moving on to the, the, the hedgehog signaling mediated regulation of the uh, Fancorinimi and BRCA pathway. And then how we designed the synthetic lethality drug combination uh, with the PARP inhibitors. As you know that the PARP inhibitors are recently approved for the uh, breast and ovarian cancers and, and most recently prostate and, uh, and pancreatic cancer also, because they work more in the DNA repair deficient uh, uh, cancers. Uh, particularly, majority of the ovarian cancers are DNA repair deficient because they are having mutations in the BRCA genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2. Uh, so that's why they work much better there. And also some of the prostate and ovarian, uh, the pancreatic cancer, uh, cancers also have these mutations. So that's how they also work in those patients. So first, what is hedgehog signaling? Hedgehog signaling is originally identified in the Drosophila. 
and then uh, this is an, a very important uh, signaling uh, pathway during the organism development so they are they actually uh, regulates several genes transcriptionally regulate several genes and uh, and uh, dip, uh, and help in differentiation of the different kind of tissues and also they maintain the stem cell pool as well so mutations in this hedgehog signaling uh, is actually a major cause of the basal cell carcinomas a type of skin cancer so the 95% of the cases have the mutations in this hedgehog signaling so why this because in the adults are the, the fully differentiated tissues the hedgehog signaling is absent they don't express they only express in in the in the the, the hair follicles or the stem cells of the skin uh, in the adults that's why if you have the mutation that's why the most common one is the basal cell carcinoma and some cases in the like you no know, 40 50% of the medulloblastomas are also are the mutations in the hedgehog signaling so so this are even the however this uh, even though it's absent in the normal adults and uh, uh, differentiated tissues so they start re-expressing in the cancer tissues when the cancers are developed in cancers the apparently activation of the hedgehog signaling is a very common phenomenon so that's why they are also be, they also become uh, uh, the uh, therapeutic targets for the several cancers so in the signaling of the hedgehog so there are three transcription factors gli1 gli2 and gli3 which actually uh, regulates many genes transcriptionally and uh, the gli1 is the major effector uh, 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 transcription factor that's why which is more important for the drug targeting so the gli can be activated either the 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 canonical signaling ligand dependent way or also non canonical dependent way uh, in the cancers particularly when you have t keras mutation tj beta uh, that inflammatory signaling as well as bit beta ketone signaling activation and several other oncogenes activation can actually induce the uh, activate the expression of this gli gli1 gene so here this uh, uh, model shows a canonical which actually uh, the ligands are hedgehog ligands there are three different kind of sonic hedgehog uh, uh, the desert hedgehog and uh, and the uh, indian hedgehog these three uh, hedgehog ligands actually the transduce the signals from membrane to the nucleus so these are the canonical signaling and the the non canonical signaling they activate directly the gli1 and then actually gli1 uh, reprograms the cells and then the, the tumors become more aggressive and resistant to the uh, the the, the uh, therapeutics so what we did is like you know, we actually took uh, the breast and ovarian cancer cells multiple ovarian cancer cells and the breast cancer cells we actually actually looked into the uh, the gene expression of the dna repair signaling by inhibiting uh, uh, the hedgehog signaling or down regulating uh, gli1 gene in both the cases what we uh, observed significantly the pang d2 gene which is one of the tumor suppressor pathway panconinemia braca pathway gene this is a, a, a critical gene which is actually significantly down regulated either you inhibit the uh, signaling or you down regulate those genes so the the most affected uh, pathway is the panconinemia and braca pathway gene so the what is panconinemia panconinemia uh, pathway is a multi gene pathway and uh, so if the mutations occur in this pathway so they actually uh, have cause of this panconinemia which is a rare genetic uh, syndrome and in these patients uh, uh, actually so they um, they are born with a different kind of uh, developmental abnormalities I, as i showed here this like you no know, radial limbs and uh, extra fingers uh, they are uh, mostly they either they are too uh, short or too tall and they also show this uh, uh, what is the called uh, the this kind of discolored uh, uh, skin uh, patches and also they have some heart problems there are several kind of defects they have and also they get lot of cancers like particularly in the ch children leukemias are very common and uh, and also when they uh, and on, only treatment is the bone marrow transplantation for these patients so particularly this pathway only work by uh, the majorly uh, uh, they are involved in the dna repair they actually uh, 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 like you no know, uh, in concert with the braca1 and the braca2 they inhibit the double strand breaks in the in the genomic dna so to confirm these uh, the this microarray studies what we did is uh, like we down regulated uh, the gli1 gene in in multiple uh, triple negative breast cancer cell lines and also 
in the over end cancer cell lines as you can see the down regulation of the gli1 itself you can see that the braca1 pang2 rad2 and all the dna repair genes are uh, consistently down regulated multiple cell lines and also the down regulation of the gli1 also causes the replication abnormalities and and the dna damage in those cells you can see this uh, when we fed the cells with the brd which is a nucleoside analog and then we observed this gamma htx which is a dna dna uh, uh, double strand break marker so they co localize as you see here the the two uh, foci so this means the the gli deficiency is causing in the cancer cells the the the, the replication associated double strand break formation and uh, and the and also the and the activation of the dna repair uh, uh, signal so to test whether uh, this gli signaling is uh, regulating the pancreatic pathway so what we did we collaborated with dr mohammad attar uh, uh, from university of alabama birmingham so he has a, this uh, genetic model of the hedgehog signaling of uh, the mouse of uh, the transgenic mouse we got this uh, mouse skins from him and uh, the wild type uh, uh, patch wild type uh, 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 the skin skin of the uh, the mouse and also the uh, patch heterozygote transgenic mouse and also the and also the the when they are exposed to the uv they also develop basal cell carcinomas and we collected the skins from multiple mouse and uh, and then and then we assessed for the expression of the the gli1 and fang d uh, to our surprise we did not find the gli activation in the wild type mouse skins and also the fang d2 also so however when you have the patch heterozygote mouse where you will have the this is the patch is the inhibitor of the gli1 uh, signaling so when you have the haplo insufficiency then you have the activation of the uh, the gli1 and you see the expression of the gli1 and fang d2 and and also in the uh, the basal cell carcinomas so we tested in multiple ways in these uh, in these models and then we concluded that that gli and uh, gli regulates the fang d2 Uh, and also we did several other uh, biochem uh, cell biology and biochem analysis to confirm that gli dependent regulation of the fang d2 i am not showing into the details of that but uh, so this is published in the neoplasia recently we can look into it so we further looked into this hair follicles where the the hedgehog signaling is more active you can see that active, wherever the gli1 is over expressed and you also see the fang d2 and they co localize these are the dapi the nuclei so you can see the cell number here and they are all co localized in the magnetic field you can see so this confirms that uh, that hedgehog signaling regulates the, the pancreatinemia braca pathway and so if we inhibit the, uh, the our hypothesis is that if we inhibit the hedgehog signaling in the breast and ovarian cancers with the the, the gli or hedgehog targeting drugs like such as lisbondibigib or gan61 and we can actually down regulate this uh, dna repair gene genes and then we can effectively target them uh, with a uh, with a parp inhibitors which are newly uh, approved drugs for the braca deficient cancers so here you, we further evaluated whether this combination works uh, our hypothesis is correct so here you can see these are the the the, the comatases high throughput comatases Uh, where you treat with uh, the hedgehog inhibitor GAN61 and PARP inhibitor Olaparib, and then combination of treatments. As you can see here, the the DNA damage is excessive uh, in the in the cells that are inhibit uh, 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 treated with uh, hedgehog inhibitor as well as PARP inhibitor, and then uh, so and then the the damage is also very excess. And these cells are DNA repair deficient. You can see the expression of the BRCA1, PANG2, and RAD51 are absent. Uh, uh in the uh, uh, the hedgehog inhibited inhibited cells whereas when the parp treated cells you can see the activation of the dna repair however when you combined with the with the uh, hedgehog inhibitor the parp inhibitor induced activation of this dna repair signaling is also inhibited in this so this uh, the hypothesis is that this should cause excessive damage in the cells and then they should the cell the cancer cells should be dying so to test that we again here you can uh, see that the combination of the treatments with the gan61 hedgehog inhibitor and parp inhibitor so the 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 synergies observed here with the with the single agent versus the uh, the, the the combination therapy in two different kind of cell lines and also the combination index values are less than 1 that means 
so they are uh, the, they are synergistic in the in the in the, in the therapeutic line. So these are the, the the studies we did, and also we went into the animal models. So here we implanted ovarian tumors into the into the mouse, uh, the nude mouse, and then treated with the single of the the combination of the therapies. You can see the combination therapy uh, almost uh, like you no know, uh, prevented the tumor growth, and uh, and uh, and then and also we evaluated in those tumors uh, specimens the the inhibition of the hijag also inhibited the expression of the the FANG D2 and uh, the, the combination of the treatment is very synergistic in the, in the, in the, in the treatment of uh, uh, the, the ovarian cancer models. So, and so the, our hypothesis here is like, uh, as we predicted that hedgehog inhibitors could actually work in combination with the PARP inhibitors more effectively. So as we hypothesize that the inhibition of the GLE itself is causing the BRCA deficiency. And then, uh, so because BRCA deficiency is nothing but DNA repair deficiency. And then they can be targeted with the PARP inhibitors. Here, the PARP is a, is a single strand break uh, repair uh, engine. And uh, in the BRCA is a double strand break repair uh, pathway. So if you are inhibiting both single strand break repair as well as double strand break, so then that, that will be uh, causing the synthetic lethality in the, in the tumor cells and they cannot survive. So the ultimate goal of the, uh, the projects are, are getting into the translational site. So we are in that path and we probably we have a long way to go, but we are working towards in collaboration with the clinicians and, and uh, get test, getting tested these drugs. So I'm sorry, I must have taken a little um, more time, but uh, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, these are the, the people, I think most of the, the Hedgehog project is uh, uh, done by Chinadure Mani, and also he was helped by Dr. Tripathi, Kaushalendra Tripathi. And uh, the, the RAD6 inhibitor project was initiated originally by Dr. Ranga Somasagara, and then, and then, uh, then uh, now it is taken up by uh, Tasmin, a graduate student. And then uh, the other uh, uh, people in the lab are working on uh, different projects. Uh, so far, I did not talk to their projects. So, however, these are the people, and the, the, the Mark Reed is my collaborator. Uh, who is a G1 oncologist, and also our facilities uh, at the Texas Tech University Health Science Center, and our collaborators in different kind of projects, and also my funding from National Cancer Institute, and also the Cancer Pre Prevention Research Institute of Texas, the uh, from a Texas funding agency, and also my the endowment funds that have, have been receiving weight loss and uh, this is uh, my group and uh, my people, and this is my family, and I would like to thank also because every man's success. We uh, like you know the family is the major force and the major dream drive. So so I would like to stop here and thank you all for listening and uh, and uh, I would like to answer any questions if you have. Yes, uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. It was very informative, uh, especially uh, you know greater understanding about uh, and about prognosis and the pharmacovigilance related uh, research that can lead to a good translational benefit. So um, if it is okay for you, can we uh, take up the question and answer section at the end of yes, the, yes, yes, yes. the The participants can keep posting their questions in the Q&A box and uh, then oh, we can okay. take it up at the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just thank, you, me thank, me you me. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Guru Subramanian. Yeah, please. So how it should... Uh... Uh, sir, uh, your uh, mic is muted, sir. Thank you, oh. uh, Professor. My mic. Oh, yes. Professor Sandil Kumar, uh, yes. it's my honor with the due uh, respect uh, from the chairman, uh, Professor Kayara Sambasivara, on behalf of the organizing uh, secretary. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker, uh, Dr. Manisha Tripathi. Uh, she is uh, working as a assistant professor.
Professor uh, in the Department of uh, Cell Biology and Biochemistry. She is a well versed uh, in uh, several uh, aspects, especially in research with respect to prostate cancer. Her research interest uh, pertains to the role of the tumor microenvironment, including immune cells in prostate cancer progression, and especially crosstalk between the epithelia and cancer associated fibroblasts, especially in castrate resistant prostate cancer. And uh, she is having a lot of uh, uh, projects currently, but I would like to specify certain uh, uh, things. So one uh, specific, uh, I would like to mention two specific area. One is uh, signaling crosstalk between the epithelia and the cancer associated fibroblast in castrate resistant prostate cancer. That is one. And number two is delineation of the role played by the prostate tumor immune microenvironment in shaping therapeutic uh, response. So that is very, very important part. And uh, with respect to her education and training, uh, her, uh, she did her uh, UG in Avadesh Pradap Singh University, Reva, and PG from uh, Barkatullah University, Bhopal, and a PhD from uh, Vanderbilt uh, University School of Medicine, USA, so her topic of interest is cancer biology. And uh, apart from that, uh, she did postdoctoral training at uh, Siddharth Sinai Medical Center, Los Angeles, USA. So this is the credentials of uh, our, uh, the second speaker, Dr. Manisha Tripathi. And apart from that, she has published a lot of uh, papers in peer reviewed uh, journals because she's working on uh, prostate cancer. So there is no doubt about that. So really, we are very fortunate to have uh, uh, Dr. Manisha Tripathi. So today, she is going to uh, deliver a lecture on uh, crosstalk between prostate cancer and uh, microenvironment reveals new therapeutic targets. That is her topic. So with this introduction, now I hand over the session to Dr. Manisha Tripathi. Please. Thank you, Dr. Guru Subramaniam. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I don't know if it is good morning or good afternoon <laughs> for good all evening. of us. Good evening. Namaskar, everyone. Um, um, uh, I want to thank um, Professor uh, Samba Shiva Rao um, for uh, kindly inviting us to uh, listen to our work and uh, also the coordinators of the webinar, uh, Professor Sindhil Kumar, Professor John, and Professor uh, Guru Subramanian. Um, with that, I can uh, start sharing my screen. Um, Dr. Pale, do you want to um, unshare yours or? Unshare, okay. So where should we go? More control. Pass. Pass okay. Sorry. Yeah, I did. Thank you, Dr. Fan. Uh, dear participants, uh, please post all your questions in the question and answer box. So then it is easy for us to... Yeah, whatever your queries, uh, we are easy to answer all the queries. Please, dear participant, please post your queries in question and answer box. Can everybody see my slide? Yes, 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 please. Great. All right. Um, so... Um, I'm going to be talking about, like Dr. Guru Subramaniam said, about the crosstalk between the prostate cancer and its microenvironment reveals new therapeutic targets. Um, the slide is not going forward. 
Okay, now it's working. Um, so um, really quickly uh, to give you uh, some uh, recent statistics about why prostate cancer is important. Why do we study it? Um, so as you can see worldwide, it is only next to lung cancer uh, with uh, about um, 1.5 million cases, uh, a little less than 1.5 million cases for prostate cancer uh, as well. Um, so it accounts for 14.1% of all the cases um, uh, overall in, in, the, in the world. So to go, um, in, before I go into the prostate cancer part, I just want to really quickly uh, talk about the anatomy of prostate. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on, on, on what I'll be talking about. Um, so prostate is a small gland that is part of male reproductive system. It's about the size of a, of a walnut and it is um, located at the base of the bladder. Um, and um, so, so this is, this is uh, the anatomy of prostate which, which has different zones. And I just want to really quickly mention about the zones. Uh, there is central zone and there is um, transition zone. In the transition zone, there is another disease of prostate that primarily happens, which is called benign prostatic hyperplasia. And the peripheral zone is where 70% uh, of prostate cancer happens. Um, the other important uh, background information I want to mention is about the androgens, which, as you know, are these are the class of uh, hormones that control the development and maintenance of the male characteristics. And uh, androgens also promote the growth of both normal and cancer cells. Um, so these bind and activate uh, to this protein, which is called androgen receptor that is expressed in the prostate cancer cells or uh, rather all the prostate cells. Um, so what happens is when, when the androgens bind to the androgen receptor, the androgen receptor is activated. And now this an activated androgen receptor, it stimulates expression of uh, these various genes that actually cause the growth of prostate cells, including prostate cancer cells. So um, uh, scientists and clinicians have taken this um, a characteristic of uh, prostate cells to their advantage and have targeted uh, this particular signaling. And that is what is called hormone therapy in, in case of prostate cancer. So the hormone therapies uh, in, in this case, uh, they, they basically decrease either the levels of androgen or they block the androgen action. So the, the goal is to um, inactivate the androgen signaling, androgen receptor signaling, which is helping these prostate cancer cells to grow. So uh, this, this therapy works as long as they are sensitive, right? So at some point, like Dr. Pale was mentioning, the resistance and insensitivity towards the treatment is the main issue, and which is also the case in case of prostate cancer. And so what happens is the prostate cancer cells, they stop responding to these therapies, which were uh, by blocking blocking this particular signaling. And um, when, when they are responding, they are of course called castrate sensitive or androgen dependent or androgen sensitive. I'm just mentioning these terms because I'll be using them in my presentation. So like I mentioned, most of the prostate cancers eventually stop responding to uh, these, this hormone therapy and they become castrate resistant um, or um, androgen independent um, uh, prostate cancer. And these therapies uh, are also referred to as androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. That is another term that I would likely use. So uh, if we uh, take a look at the clinical stages of prostate cancer, prostate cancer starts out as a localized disease and it uh, progresses to a non-metastatic and castrate sensitive state. So this is the state where we can still target it using the androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. Now this moves on to a metastatic state. Um, however, as long as uh, they are still castration sensitive um, in, in case of either metastasis or uh, non-metastatic state, we are, we are still okay in handling the disease. Um, the problem arises when uh, the, the, the metastasis becomes clinically resist, uh, castration resistant. 
at this stage, um, they stop responding to androgen deprivation therapy. That is the standard of care for prostate cancer patients. And then um, it is almost like downhill here on where uh, these uh, patients stop responding to other therapies that are used, for example, the chemotherapy that, so they become docetaxel resistant, they become, um, so enzalutamide is one of the androgen deprivation therapy uh, drugs. Um, uh, Bicalutamide is the other one that I, I will be talking about. And um, so here on um, uh, the, as you can see, the death from prostate cancer, um, it, the, the, the numbers also keep on rising because of this um, resistance that the patients have developed. So um, as, as the title of my talk included microenvironment, I want to briefly mention about what I mean by when I say microenvironment. So um, as, as uh, you all know that uh, the epithelial cells in, in our body, uh, uh, in this case, we are talking about prostate adenocarcinoma. So epithelial cells of the prostate are the ones that develop the tumor. So any epithelial cell is, is around uh, in our body is surrounded by these different cells, including the fibroblasts or the immune cells. There are vessels, there is extracellular matrix around. So everything that is around is, is termed as microenvironment. And same is the case in case of cancer and it's called tumor microenvironment in case of uh, cancer. So, um, so, so basically when an anti-cancer drug is administered, um, it, it not only actually affects the, the epithelial cells, which is uh, primarily uh, the focus of uh, majority of the research work done, but we have to, um, um, acknowledge that uh, the microenvironment cells, all these uh, immune cells, all these fibroblasts, they are also the ones that are actually um, getting affected. And um, so, so in, in cancer, the way this disease is fueled is also by this uh, crosstalk or the communication that happens between the cancer cells and these cells of microenvironment, including the fibroblast and the immune cells. So um, one of the areas of my research is also focused on if we can somehow target this crosstalk that happens, it should be, we should be able to handle the disease better because this, um, these, these microenvironment cells also develop the resistance, also fuel in the progression of uh, cancer by talking to these cancer cells. So, um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about two stories. One of them is about this anti-cancer drug, and then the other is about how we could potentially target this crosstalk. So the first talk is, uh, the first part is about the uh, microenvironment, how it uh, mediates the efficacy of uh, anti-cancer drug, um, cabozantinib. Um, and don't worry about it. If I take too much time, we can skip the second part of the talk and we can talk at some point later. Um, so uh, giving you a brief introduction about cabozantinib or XL184, it is a small molecule inhibitor of uh, multiple receptor tyrosine kinases, as you can see here listed. And um, it has been actually approved by FDA for treatment of certain cancers like metastatic medullary thyroid cancer and advanced renal cell carcinoma. And primarily the uh, action of this drug is dependent on its activity on um, MET and uh, VEGFR2. Um, However, what my story tells you today is about not only its anti-tumorogenic effect, pro-tumorogenic effect that might be actually affecting its um, efficacy. So uh, if you look at the prostate cancer treatment landscape, um, the localized disease or the local prostate cancer is usually handled by uh, surgery or radiation. Um, and, and then a next uh, standard of care is androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. However, like I mentioned, majority of the prostate cancer uh, patients, they develop resistance towards these androgen deprivation therapy. And at this point, the disease is called castration-resistant prostate cancer or CRPC. 
at this point, um, clinicians use um, various uh, other therapies that are available, like even immune therapy or chemotherapy or advanced uh, or next generation uh, chemotherapy, and also next generation androgen deprivation therapy agents. Um, and 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 um, one of one of these uh, uh, therapies also included. Um, was uh, is called cabozentinib, um, which, like I mentioned, is is approved for other cancers but not for prostate cancer. So this was the clinical trial where it was found that cabozentinib was especially uh, uh, um, effective for the advanced staged prostate cancer. So this this was the result that was published published way back, where they had actually found that uh, due to the treatment of cabozentinib, um, as you can see here, uh, the 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 patients um, after twelve weeks um, had a significant decrease in their metastatic burden, and this is especially important because I want to mention that in case of prostate cancer, it actually primarily metastasizes to bone, and at that point there is no cure for this. Uh, disease. And so what they found with this drug was that there was a radiographic progression-free survival. It was affecting tumors, uh, circulating tumor cells. Um, and, and there were um, effect on, 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 the, on the bone mass. Um, however, um, now the question was whether it would affect the overall survival. So, um, so the, the drug, cabozentinib, um, uh, just like other cancer drugs, is, is, was primarily looked upon as to a drug that was going to affect the cancer cells or the epithelial cells. However, the story that I'm going to tell you today is a little uh, different in the sense that it might be actually also working through the microenvironment. And uh, like I mentioned, there are various components of microenvironment. And for uh, the purpose of this part, um, this drug was primarily affecting the fibroblasts or the macrophages. And that's how it was affecting in a paracrine manner onto the tumor cells. So to study the effect of cabozentinib um, on, on the microenvironment, we did a simple experiment where we took the mice and we injected them with this drug, cabozentinib. Um, so these are the, the, the control mice that were not injected with the drug. And then uh, the burden panel is where the mice were injected with the, uh, with the drug. And after injection of the drug, so remember there's no cancer here involved yet. After we had uh, given the drug, drug to the, the, the mice, then we injected uh, the tumor cells into these mice. And uh, we, we were expecting that the presence of a drug would actually decrease the tumor uh, burden, if any. Um, very surprisingly, we found that when the drug was given uh, to the mice before and after that, when the, the, the tumor cells were injected, the tumor burden was actually more in the mice where the mice had received this drug prior uh, to the um, injection of the tumor. So this experiment suggested that probably there is a role of a tumor uh, microenvironment um, in, in the efficacy of this drug. So one of the um, popular, uh, one of the tumor microenvironment cells that we looked on are macrophages. And just to give you a brief background about uh, macrophages, these are the the mm, cells that are derived from monocytes, and they come in all different flavors. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus only on the M1 uh, and M2 macrophages. So just remember that M1 macrophages are the pro-inflammatory or anti-tumorogenic macrophages, whereas the M2 macrophages are the anti-inflammatory or pro-tumorogenic uh, macrophages. So, so to say that M1 macrophages are the, in, in, in terms of for uh, tumor, are the good macrophages, and the M2 macrophages being the pro-tumorogenic are, are not the good macrophages. Um, um, so what we found in the mice that I uh, showed you in the previous slide, we found there was a decrease in the M1 macrophage population when they received the drug. However, there was not a significant dif di di difference between the 
two groups in uh, if you look at the M2 macrophage population. So M1, if it is um, like uh, I mentioned, is the anti-tumorogenic uh, macrophage. So remember, this drug is an anti-tumor drug. So this suggests that then the anti-tumorogenic effect was not through macrophages. Um, so now we wanted to uh, sort of um, screen through what are the microenvironmental cells or the stroma cells that are actually getting affected uh, by this drug. So uh, here you can see this RKMM is actually an epithelial cells. And you can see the rate of proliferation is decreased, but only after about one micromolar concentration. Whereas the cells here labeled in red, the cancer associated fibroblast or the calf or bone marrow stromal cells or macrophages, these are the cells that are cells of the microenvironment. And you can see that as compared to the epithelial cells, there is uh, quite a bit of decrease in the proliferative efficacy, uh, efficiency of these cells. So clearly the microenvironment cells are getting affected by this, this drug. So we did another experiment and this is a little bit of a complicated experiment. So let me explain this to you. Um, in this experiment, we uh, took the epithelial cells. Again, the RKPM cells are the epithelial cells and we treated them with calf condition media. Um, calf are the cancer associated fibroblasts. So we culture the cancer associated fibroblasts and um, we do the treatments on these cancer associated fibroblasts and then we collect the spent media or the condition media from these cells and we treat them onto the epithelial cells and to see the effect um, or sort of indirect effect or the paracrine effect of, of, uh, these, uh, of these cells on, on the tumor cells. So what we found was that um, the gist of the experiment is that when, when the stromal cells were actually treated with cabozentinib, and that condition media, when it was uh, given to the epithelial cells, that uh, decreased these um, the, the 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 ability of these cells uh, to form tumor or to engraft in the bone, uh, but not necessarily the tumor expansion in the bone. So there are two two things that are being uh, looked upon here. One of them is through luciferase, we are looking at the tumor uh, cells expansion, and then cathepsin K is uh, where we are looking at what is happening to the bone, the bone turnover. So that is the part that is getting affected um, more than the, um, um, tumor cells or cancer cells itself. So the second thing we wanted to look at um, was how this um, cabozentinib was affecting the progenitor cell population or the stem cell population uh, through the paracrine effect. So remember, like Dr. Pale mentioned about the, the cancer stem cells and how uh, um, their lab works on these uh, sphere forming or organoid uh, type of culture to see how a drug affects um, the cancer stem cell population. So if a uh, cancer drug is given, then the cancer stem cells are the cells that actually survive. And then later on in the relapse, these are the cells that actually grow, help the tumor grow back. So um, uh, these, these uh, cancer associated fibroblasts and normal associated fibroblasts, they have their paracrine activity because they are around the cancer. So when we add the conditioned media or the spent media from the culture of these fibroblasts, they give certain paracrine factors to these uh, tumor cells for their various functions. And one of the functions that is getting affected here is the sphere forming ability. So as you can see, when the calf or cancer associated fibroblast media is, is, is given to the spheres, they are growing much bigger as compared to the normal uh, prostate fibroblast condition media. So what we did was we treated the fibroblast or the stroma is here um, another name for fibroblast you can say so the culture of the um, fibroblast were were given uh, cabozentinib where uh, whereas the other set of the fibroblast were 
given the just the control, right? So no, no drug in that. Now that conditioned media was added on to the spheres. And what we found was that um, the stromal cells that were treated with cabozentinib, their uh, spent media was able to reduce uh, the, these spheres to, um, to smaller size as compared to when the drug was not given to the fibroblast. So also the number of spheres was affected as you can see here, plus Gambo, the number of sphere is way less. And uh, this again shows that the stem population was decreased because uh, SCAR1 CD49F population was decreased and SCAR1 CD 133 population was also decreased. This is um, through the facts analysis we found. Um, so um, this 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 experiment. Then we went on to do it in 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 vivo and in mouse. Again, Dr. Pale had mentioned this assay before. Uh, so um, the same same idea where the BRDO retention is basically uh, showing that these cells are slowly dividing. So you can clearly see that here, although the Ki sixty seven, which is the proliferation marker, is not getting changed. However, the BRDO positive cells they are being decreased. So uh, cabozentinib is affecting the slow cycling stem-like population in prostate. So just to summarize, um, we found that cabozentinib affects the M1 population and um, it also affects the stem population, although this effect might be uh, also through the cancer-associated fibroblasts. So um, however, the the, the cells that are not uh, getting much affected by cabozentinib in our experiments looks like the proliferative epithelia. So we decided to handle that part um, using a chemotherapy drug, docetaxel, which is um, known to of course affect the proliferating epithelia, but also it affects the um, macrophage population um, by targeting the um, pro-tumorogenic um, macrophages. So this is the, the result of the in vivo experiment where we saw there was a decrease when cabozentinib was added along with uh, uh, docetaxel. And the, the, the reason we think that was happening is because um, the stem cell population that are SOX2 positive, uh, they are known to get upregulated when a chemotherapy drug is given. And as you can see right here, when the um, docetaxel is given, that, that population is increased. And then upon um, addition of cabozentinib, this population um, decreases. So together, docetaxel and cabozentinib, the idea is that we are able to target the Effect the proliferating cells through docetaxel and then the stem population through cabozentinib, and that will help us tackle the tumor better. Also, like I mentioned about the macrophage population, here again, in the presence of uh, um, docetaxel and cabozentinib, um, you can see the M1 population is, is, is getting um, almost equal to the, to the control levels. So um, uh, we wanted to know if, uh, if, if uh, this is what actually also happens in clinic or it has certain significance what happens in the clinic. So for that, we collaborated with um, your oncologist, um, Dr. Posadis and, and, a, uh, and an immunologist, um, Ka uh, Karen. And uh, so, so here, um, the, the clinical response to cabozentinib uh, was actually determined by the clinical imaging by the clinicians. And so the circulating monocytes. So remember, the mo I mentioned that the monocytes are the cells that the macrophages uh, are derived from. So these circulating monocytes um, from, from uh, these patients, they were taken, and then we differentiated them into the macrophages. And we, act we found that, interestingly, this is also that happens in the clinic. So this is the M1 um, macrophage population. And this is before the, 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 the treatment. And after the treatment, you can see a drastic decrease in uh, um, uh, macro, M1 macrophage population in, in certain patients. Um, so this uh, suggests that it could actually also uh, could be used as a, as, as a marker uh, for uh, uh, prostate cancer at, at this step, advanced stage. So just to um, summarize um, 
what, what we found in the project was this particular drug, cabozentinib, it not only affected uh, the, the M1 macrophage polarization, but it also affected the, the stem population and then cancer associated fibroblast or the tumor microenvironment had a role to play in that. And then when we addressed the proliferative epithelia, which was looking like not much disturbed by cabozentinib, we used docetaxel uh, that increased the M1 or the good macrophage population, and it also affected the proliferating epithelia. So, um, so, so, so the gist of the uh, talk uh, is at this point or the project is that an anti-cancer drug not only affects the epithelial cells, but it also affects the, uh, the fibroblast uh, or, uh, and, and even the macrophage, so the, the cells of the microenvironment. And if we could somehow target this crosstalk, um, we, sh we should be able to um, handle the tumor or the resistance part of uh, uh, cancer better. And in case of prostate cancer, um, again, um, androgen deprivation therapy and later on, even the chemotherapy, um, it, the, the tumor develops resistance towards it. Um, I think based on uh, the time I, I'm going to um, end my talk at this uh, Part and then I just want to quickly uh, go over the um, my acknowledgement slides and uh, I'm sure you guys are thinking that oh this part of the talk is also looking great so hopefully I'll have a chance to talk to you about that uh, sometime later um, so. Okay, so um, yeah I just want to mention this uh, slide as well. Uh, in, in, in my lab, we are also trying to develop a sort of a framework uh, because like I said in the talk that you, you could see how, uh, how differently the tumor microenvironment cells uh, um, respond to a therapy. So it, it would be uh, kind of nice to find out um, if a patient is actually going to respond to therapy or not before giving the, the, the therapy to the patient. And based on that, we can decide what kind of therapy a patient should be given. So for that framework, we uh, are working on um, having the, the tissues from the patients or the blood and then um, either uh, having them in culture, for example, for the, for the fibroblasts or the macrophages, or have them as PDXs or patient-derived xenografts in the mouse, and then test um, the, the gene expression from, from these, these two cases, and also uh, do the 3D cultures where actually we can see the resistance or sensitivity of this any particular therapy. For a, for a patient and therefore decide the appropriate therapy for the patient. Um, so again, um, the, the, the take home message from that part of the talk is if we could repurpose the epithelial targeted drug um, to the heterogeneous tumor microenvironment so that we can have more effective therapy and also uh, it can help in choosing the therapy combinations. Um, I want to quickly thank uh, um, my, my, my lab people, and, and this is my lab uh, currently. Um, Girijesh is, is the postdoc, and Shanika Datta is the PhD student, um, and uh, this is Jonathan, um, who is currently a med school student, um, and these are undergrad students, uh, V and Min, and then we have uh, um, uh, Musharraf, he was the master student. Um, so the 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 the, ta uh, the part of the project that I talked to you today, um, I was primarily I would like to thank for that Dr. Bomek, Dr. Leland Chung, Dr. Posadas from Cedars Sinai Medical Center, and Dr. Shin Lee from Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, my funding sources uh, Department of uh, Defense, and um, also um, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. Um, and with that, I believe um, I have to take the questions at the um, end of the uh, end of all, all the talks. So um, that's all that I had. Thank you for listening. And uh, you can move on to Dr. Thank Lundin. you. Thank you for your valuable and informative lecture. I think, yeah, at the end, uh, yeah, again, we'll discuss in elaborate way. Yes. So, Professor Sentil, 
now you can introduce the third speaker yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much dr manisha so it was uh, again a uh, wonderful talk and very informative so now uh, we will move on to the third speaker uh, dr shrinivas nandana who is going to talk about the prostate cancer progression uh, novel signaling mechanisms and uh, the mouse models so uh, he is also in the department of cell biology and biochemistry in texas tech university health sciences center and uh, he had his uh, graduation from andhra university post graduation from Bar Kutla University, Bhopal, PhD from Vanderbilt Uni University School of Medicine uh, and uh, the postdoctoral training in Los Angeles, uh, Siddharth Sinai Medical Center. So uh, he has uh, to his credit a lot of awards, uh, including the uh, uh, travel awards and uh, AACAR award for uh, uh, to attend the Edward uh, Smuggler Memorial Pathology of Cancer Workshop and also in 2019 uh, for Cancers, the Cover Photo Award. So uh, he has been uh, working upon various uh, peer-reviewed uh, funded uh, research grants uh, on uh, novel immune intact mouse model of prostate cancer bone metastasis, uh, and uh, also on the role of TBX2 in mediating the brand kl pathway in prostate, uh, prostate uh, tumor prog progression and bone metastasis. And, uh, the pre-doctoral fellowship award on investigating the role of PBX2 in the inhibition of senescence in prostate cancer. So um, the, he has a lot of uh, publications to his credit in highly reputed international journals like Cancers, uh, Asian Journal of Urology, Cancer Research, uh, Onco Target, and uh, Clinical Cancer Research, American Journal of Clinical and Experimental Urology, uh, Prostate, androgen action in prostate cancer, molecular cytogenetics, differentiation, etc. So he has also uh, presented uh, many abstracts in international conferences and workshops and also delivered uh, invited talks and uh, presentations. So uh, he is basically uh, working on signaling mechanism mediating prostate cancer metastasis uh, to generate mouse models to better mimic prostate cancer bone metastasis and on the role of immune microenvironment in prostate cancer bone metastatic cascade. So these are his research interests. And he is the uh, husband of the previous speaker. Uh, and uh, so the, it is great that they both work on the same similar areas of research in the same department. Yeah. So uh, welcome, Dr. Srinivas, and uh, please. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, Dr. Santil Kumar. So I just want to see if everyone can see my slide. And if they can hear me. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, voice is clear. All right. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, first I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Samba Sivrao and uh, uh, Professor Santil Kumar uh, Professor Guru Subramaniam and uh, Professor John for uh, giving us uh, giving us this uh, you know opportunity to talk uh, about our work. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And so, um, uh, so, so what I'm going to do today is um, uh, to talk about uh, some of the uh, projects that uh, I am pursuing in in my lab. And uh, um, so, so. Um, one of the focus of my lab is, uh, as, as Manisha mentioned, uh, if you look at the clinical challenges associated with uh, uh, human prostate cancer, um, you know, uh, castrate resistance is one of the challenges because um, the patients uh, no longer respond to androgen deprivation therapy. And the other predominant challenge in prostate cancer is how these prostate cancer cells escape the primary site, which is obviously the prostate. So they escape the prostate, get into the bloodstream and travel to distant sites, which we call uh, distant metastasis. And, and, and it so happens that in human prostate cancer, the, uh, these cells predominantly metastasize to the bone. And so one of the focus of my lab 
is to ask the question or uh, what are the molecular mechanisms uh, by which these prostate cancer cells now metastasize to the bone? Because uh, through years of elegant work, we now know that the metastatic process is not a random process and that there are specific strategies employed by the prostate cancer cells that tell them that, okay, we have to metastasize to the bone and not some other organ. So what are the molecular changes that happen in these uh, cancer cells? So, um, all right. Um, Okay, so, um, you know, so now we know um, for the past decade or so, uh, maybe a little more than a decade, uh, that the process of metastasis is, is not a random process and that it's a complicated multi-step process in which the primary tumor, for example, this is the primary tumor here depicted here, through processes that uh, we now know are molecular specific processes, um, these, uh, these tumor cells, uh, they escape the primary site through, uh, the, through molecular processes called, uh, we, we now know as, uh, you know, EMT is one of them, the epithelial mesenchymal transition, and these uh, primary tumor cells intravasate uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, they survive in the circulation, travel in the bloodstream to distant places. Uh, for example, in, in case of prostate cancer, the bone, they extravasate or get out of the bloodstream and they set up shop at the distant places, which we now call as metastatic colonization. So in a sense, the metastatic process is a strategic process that is governed by uh, specific molecular events. And we now know that at each step of this uh, complicated uh, metastatic process, including intravasation, extravasation, there are specific molecular changes that take place in the cancer cells. So, um, so like I mentioned, uh, uh, so this was a, a review article that um, we published recently. And, and, and it so happens that um, just like many other cancers, uh, prostate cancer cells, they use strategy instead of brute force to achieve metastasis. And, and how do they do that? Well, um, you know, some of the strategies uh, employed by prostate cancer cells is, is for example, uh, there is extensive reprogramming of the, of the genome. Then uh, there is the immune involvement uh, um, akin to something uh, that Manisha mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, all these, um, the other cells that are in the vicinity of the cancer cells, including the immune cells, they act as culprits. Uh, uh, or they aid the metastatic process. And then uh, we also know that the tumor cells could be sending out packets of information that we now call as extracellular vesicles. These extracellular vesicles travel through the bloodstream even before the primary prostate cancer cells can get out of the primary site. These extracellular vesicles that are secreted by the uh, tumor, primary tumor cells uh, get into the bloodstream, get to the distant places and, and you know, prime the distant places so that uh, the primary tumor cells can later get to these distant sites. And, and, and so the microenvironment there is already rich for them to grow. So these are some of the strategies that the, the prostate cancer cells use um, to uh, uh, for strategic metastatic purposes. And so, like I mentioned, uh, prostate cancer cells predominantly 
uh, metastasized to the bone. And uh, uh, you know, there are specific uh, molecular changes that happen. For example, these prostate cancer cells, they start secreting some of the uh, growth factors like fibrobra fibroblast growth factor, uh, the rank ligand, uh, some of the interleukins, the winds. And when they, when they get to the bone, these uh, growth factors, they, they impinge on the osteoblasts of the bone uh, to secrete a factor that we now call rank ligand uh, shown here. And the rank ligand uh, um, acts as a cue for the pre-osteoclasts uh, to secrete rank. And so the rank and the rank ligand they interact with each other. Uh, so this is the ligand, this is the receptor. So the, the receptor ligand interactions in turn cause the pre-osteoclasts to mature into the uh, osteoclasts. And what happens is that these osteoclasts, they start chewing up the bone and which in turn results in the secretion of more growth factors from the bone like TGF beta, BMPs and IGFs. And so what happens is it becomes a vicious cycle wherein the prostate cancer cells are uh, uh, you know, inflicting uh, damage to the bone. And so this vicious cycle uh, in turn uh, results in the, the damage to the bone uh, where, wherein Clinically, what you see is that um, the, the patients uh, that have manifested bone metastases, um, they develop uh, complications of the bone like fractures, spinal compression, and pain. Um, and so this is one of the predominant challenges in prostate cancer treatment. And so, um, and so you know, uh, one of the questions and, and uh, one of the focus in our lab is what are the molecular factors that drive this process of uh, prostate cancer um, bone metastasis? So, um, so what are the ways in which uh, we can, you know, study this process of uh, metastasis or in this case specifically uh, bone metastasis? One of the ways uh, is, is to employ mouse models uh, to look at this process. So, so, and, and so these mouse models can, can um, act as tools by which uh, you can replicate uh, the process of uh, metastatic manifestation. So, so I just wanted to you know, give you a brief um, flavor of the different mouse models uh, that we use in the lab and that are being extensively used in the field. Uh, so one category of mouse models is called the xenograph mouse models, uh, in which what you essentially do is to uh, engraft uh, uh, you know, human cancer cells. It could be human prostate cancer cells in these uh, mice and, you know, uh, and, and these mice are essentially immune compromised, and therefore um, you can you can look at uh, the the progression of the human uh, cancer cells or the uh, patient derived xenograft uh, models. Now, while xenograft mouse models can give you several advantages, for example, uh, you can you can you know begin to look at the biology of these tumors and also uh, you know, do experiments uh, looking at the therapeutic um, uh, angle. Uh, there are always some disadvantages associated. For example, the xenograft mouse models, you could not, or it is not possible to look at the full immune, uh, uh, you know, response. Uh, because like I said, these uh, mouse models are immune uh, compromised. So then another approach is to, um, look at uh, you know, tumor progression in, in a model that we call the syngenic uh, mouse models. And this is considered one step forward uh, uh, as compared to xenograft mouse models, uh, because now these, uh, you, can, you can begin to ask the question, 
uh, you know, can I also look at the immune progression uh, uh, in, in the progression of this cancer? And then um, another category of mouse models is called the genetically engineered mouse models um, or the gem models, um, or you know, uh, other terms uh, for these models are transgenic models or knockout models. And so um, th these are considered the best models, the genetically engineered mouse models, because here you can look at the progression. You can, uh, for example, you have a gene X, and you say that what is the contribution of gene X in the progression of this uh, tumor, both in the physiological as well as immune, uh, uh, in, the, in the context of the immune system. However, um, for some reason, it has not been possible um, uh, to, to create a very good model of prostate cancer bone metastasis uh, using the genetically engineered mouse model. And so the reason I mentioned these models is the first story that I, I will be talking about is a story on uh, a transcription factor called T-box2 and how we were able to look at the, uh, at the, at the contribution of T-box2 in, in the progression of prostate cancer uh, bone metastasis in the context of a xenograft mouse model. And the second story that I'll be talking about is um, a mouse model that we recently developed uh, or a syngenic mouse model that we recently developed. And we are asking the question, uh, what is the contribution of the individual uh, immune cells in, in the progression of uh, prostate cancer bone metastasis? And so this is the first story I will talk about. Uh, so T-box2 is a transcription factor that we have been working with. And, uh, um, and so basically T-box2 or TBX2 uh, belongs to a family of transcription factors uh, that have for several years have, have, uh, have a documented role in embryonic development. And for the past uh, few years, the T-box2 has been implicated in uh, cancer progression as well. And so using the xenograft mouse model, uh, we were able to look at the, the biological function of TBX2 and uh, some of the downstream effectors of TBX2 and how uh, TBX2 mediates the prostate cancer bone metastasis. And so, uh, so we were able to, so these are human uh, prostate cancer uh, 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 patient tissue sections. And we were able to uh, look at uh, the fact that TBX2 expression um, increases with uh, the disease progression. For example, uh, BPH is, is something very akin to normal prostate. So if you compare to different Gleason scores, Gleason 3, Gleason 4, or the ultimate uh, bone metastatic step of prostate cancer, and we are looking at the, the immunohistochemical staining of TBX2. So we were able to see that uh, TBX2 expression uh, increases with the increasing um, uh, disease progression. And so um, we were also able to uh, find out uh, that using xenograft mouse models uh, and, and, and uh, human prostate uh, cancer cell lines with lineage relationships, so what do I mean with uh, what do I mean by re lineage relationship? Is for example, the RCAP E uh, uh, is a human prostate cancer cell line uh, that is very uh, that is non-metastatic, which forms a tumor, but it's non-metastatic. Whereas the RCAP M, which is lineage related to RCAP E, now can metastasize to distant places, including the bone, right? and the RCAP M bone met. So all these three human, uh, human prostate cancer cells are lineage related, but they, with increasing potential uh, uh, to, 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 uh, you know, in the progression of the disease. And for example, uh, the LINCAP C42 and C42B is also another set of lineage related human prostate cancer cell lines. And uh, the third set that we looked at was LINCAP. Uh, NEO is nothing but the, the control or the wild type. 
and the LENCAP overexpressing rank ligand and the LENCAP rank L bone met. So in all three sets of these um, lineage related human prostate cancer cell lines, when we looked at the xenografts, we found that there is increasing uh, uh, expression of PDX2 with the increasing metastatic potential, suggesting that TBX2 is linked with the metastatic progression in human prostate cancer. And so uh, we also found that, uh, that along with TBX2, um, WINT, uh, WINT3A specifically, is associated with this malignant uh, progression from the normal uh, to the bone metastatic. So when we looked at the lineage related cell lines, along with, an uh, along with the, the observation that we saw that TBX2 is increasing in, uh, towards the bone, uh, increasing metastatic or the increasing bone metastatic cell lines, we also found that the WINT3A uh, expression is increasing with the metastatic potential of these cell lines, suggesting that maybe there is a link between TBX2 and WINT3A expression, which we delineated later in the studies. So this is um, a slide uh, that, that gives you a little bit of background of how the, the WINT signaling works. Uh, so essentially what happens is the WINT um, uh, is the ligand that, that binds to the LRP or the frizzled receptor. And uh, uh, essentially what happens is when the wind binds, uh, the, 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 the destruction complex that disrupts beta-catenin itself gets disrupted, disrupted. And so beta-catenin is able to translocate to the nucleus and activate the downstream genes like um, CMIC, uh, MMPs, so, so this is what happens in the typical canonical, um, you know, wind and beta catenin signaling. And so incidentally, a large um, study, when we were looking at TBX2 uh, in, in, in the models, uh, there was a large study that found abnormalities of wind signaling in castrate resistant prostate cancer. I will not go uh, into in-depth in, into what is castrate resistant prostate cancer because Manisha uh, already gave a very good background of how you know, prostate cancer progresses to something, uh, 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 a subtype of prostate cancer, which we call CRPC or castrate resistant prostate cancer, which is a clinical challenge. And then several reports have found that beta-catenin is overexpressed in human prostate cancer. Um, and so, so now that we knew that TBX2 is associated with the metastatic prostate cancer, the question for us was to, you know, uh, to, to de delineate how exactly is TBX2 uh, uh, participating in this metastatic progression. So, uh, and, and then we used different um, uh, xenograft mouse models so even within the xenograft mouse models, you have several models. For example, uh, you, can, you can look at the local invasion uh, using the kidney uh, xenograft mouse model, or which we call as the subrenal capsule uh, xenograft mouse model. Uh, then there's another model which we call the intracardiac uh, uh, um, inoculation xenograft model, which, by which you can look at the distant metastasis. Uh, and then um, if you want to specifically look at how these prostate cancer cells are changing the microenvironment within the bone, there's another xenograft model that we employ, which is called the intratibial uh, uh, xenograft mouse model. So which I will be uh, you know, talking briefly. So for instance, um, we, we wanted to um, interrogate or ask the contribution of TBX2 in the uh, um, local invasion. So, so, so the way we did the experiment was to block the endogenous TBX2 um, uh, using a dominant negative approach. And uh, so PC3 is a human prostate cancer cell line. And when we, so PC3 expresses a lot of TBX2. 
And so we ask the question, so PC3neo is the, the wild type or the control xenograph. And the PC3TBX2DN is the xenograph wherein we have blocked endogenous TBX2 expression in the PC3 cells. And xenografted them in the uh, uh, subrenal capsule of nude mice. And uh, so here what you're seeing is this part is the uh, the, the, the tumors then that we xenografted or the prostate cancer cells that we xenografted. And the other part is, this part is the, uh, the kidney of the mouse. And so essentially what we are looking at is that our xenograph, uh, how is it behaving, uh, uh, you know, in terms of its invasive ability. And so if you look at the, the wild type of the PC3neo, uh, it's causing this uh, invasive border uh, at the at the tumor uh, kidney interface. Whereas when we block the TBX2, you see a much more uh, delineated or non-invasive uh, border, suggesting that a TBX2 is causing the the local uh, um, invasion uh, of these prostate cancer cells. So. So we, we um, did another experiment uh, wherein uh, we employed another xenograft mouse model. Uh, this time we call it as the orthotopic xenograft model. So, so, so then what is the difference? The difference is that in the orthotopic xenograft model, we uh, uh, put the xenograft within uh, the prostate of the mouse. So, which is considered a physiologically more relevant model because now you are looking at uh, how the progression happens within the mic uh, within the prostate, right? And so, quickly, uh, uh, these PC3 neo cells or the PC3 control cells, when you put them in the uh, prostate of the mouse, they they readily are uh, they uh, they uh, invade and um, to the regional lymph nodes of the mouse. Um, so here uh, it is shown the lymph node metastasis of the PC3 neo uh, uh, xenograft. Whereas when we blocked the PC, uh, the TBX2 in the PC3 cells, and we, when we looked at the uh, xenograft, uh, I'm sorry, the lymph nodes of the mouse, we were not able to find any metastatic uh, process to the regional lymph nodes, suggesting the TBX2 is mediating the regional uh, metastasis to the lymph nodes. And, and so, uh, like I mentioned, uh, predominantly in prostate cancer, uh, the, the metastatic site is the bone, right? And so we ask the question, uh, uh, is TBX2, uh, what is the functionality of TBX2 in mediating this distant metastasis uh, to the bone? And here we employed a, a xenograft mouse model that we call the intracardiac mouse model in which we uh, inject the cells directly into the in, uh, left ventricle of the uh, mouse. And we can image the, the, the tumor using bioluminescence imaging. And so uh, this RCAP M cell, uh, RCAP M neo cells, when you uh, uh, inject intracardiac into the mouse, they, um, they, they form distant metastases. For example, here, uh, they have metastasized to the, uh, the, the leg of the mouse. Whereas when we block TBX2 in the RCAP M cells, we were not able to detect any uh, 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 distant metastases in the mouse, suggesting that TBX2 in addition to the local invasion and the regional invasion also plays a, a role in the distant metastasis. And so this was another cell line that we used uh, for the intracardiac inoculation. I will skip, skip this uh, slide, essentially showing the same phenotype that when we block TBX2 in human prostate cancer cells, we are, we are able to block the distant metastasis to the bone. And, and here, uh, we, so here we ask the question, all right, uh, so prostate, human prostate cancer cells metastasize to the bone, right? 
so what happens after they get to the bone? How do they disturb the bone homeostatic balance? And so uh, this is a xenograft mouse model that we employ, uh, which we call the intratibial uh, mouse model in which you can directly inject the, the, the cancer cells in the tibia of the, uh, uh, of the mouse. And you can see the um, you know, extensive uh, uh, changes in the bone remodeling that happens. And so uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the gist of this experiment was that we found that in addition to uh, the metastatic process, TBX2 also plays a role in the bone remodeling step. Uh, so essentially, uh, so, so we knew that TBX2 is playing a role in metastasis. So then we wanted to tease out the mechanism uh, uh, as to how TBX2 is doing this. And, and we found that uh, the uh, TBX2 is, um, you know, regulating transcriptionally WINT3A expression. And, uh, and the winds have been implicated in the, the metastasis in uh, prostate cancer. So essentially TBX2 is a transcription factor and through uh, uh, transcriptionally regulating wind 3 a uh, it is regulating the metastatic process. So here in this experiment, essentially what we did was that we rescued wind 3 a expression within the context of blocking uh, TBX2 in the PC3 cells. And then what we found was that when we rescue wind 3 expression in the context of blocking TBX2, we are able to partially rescue the metastatic ability, suggesting strongly that TBX2 is mediating the metastatic step uh, through wind 3 a and so this was the gist of the story uh, uh, that using uh, these uh, xenograft mouse models, we were able to, uh, you know, investigate the biological function of uh, TBX2 in the metastatic process. And so this is the, the other uh, story that I want to uh, talk about. Like I mentioned, uh, syngenic mouse models is a one step forward uh, in wherein you can investigate the, uh, in addition to the molecular uh, mechanism, you can also investigate the, uh, the, the contribution of the immune system in a much more meaningful way. So here, what we did was, uh, remember I, I mentioned about a molecule called rank ligand, which is expressed predominantly on the surface of osteoblast. And this rank rank ligand interaction uh, it leads to, you know, uh, the, the osteoblast, osteoclast balance in the bone. And essentially what we found in this story was that rank ligand mediates prostate cancer bone metastasis using this syngenic mouse model that we created. And so um, uh, I mentioned the contribution of rank ligand uh, within, the, within the bone, right? But it so happens that in addition to the bone, rank ligand is also expressed in the primary prostate cancer cells. And, and what uh, uh, has been found is that the rank ligand uh, increases with the increasing progression of human prostate cancer. And not only the, the, the uh, expression of rank ligand is increased, but um, the increasing rank ligand in the human prostate cancer uh, um, correlates uh, with the progression of the disease and also uh, the survival of human prostate cancer patients. So the, the more rank ligand is expressed in human prostate cancer, the less uh, probability uh, that the patient will survive. So it's strongly linked to the uh, survival characteristic. And that is why we chose this rank ligand molecule uh, to create our syngenic mouse model. And so what we did was um, that, you know, we take immune competent mice. So now it is not nude mice anymore. These are immune competent mice, black sex mice. And uh, we inject a, a prostate cancer cell line, which we call MPC3. And so what is this MPC3 cells? 
these MPC3 cells are deficient for P10 and P53. And both P10 and P53 are intricately linked with human prostate cancer progression. For example, P10 is known to be lost in prostate cancer progression and P53 is also known to be lost. So, so here, what, what, uh, basically what we found was that if you inject the MPC3 cells intracardiac in the mouse, they fail to metastasize anywhere. Whereas um, if, you, uh, if you deplete B cells using a CD20 uh, depleting antibody that specifically depletes only the B cells, and, and then you inject these MP3 cells, MPC3 cells in the, uh, in the uh, mouse using the intracardiac model, you now begin to see bone metastasis in the mouse, suggesting that B cells are playing a role in this metastatic progression, which uh, we were able to delineate only using this syngenic mouse model, because this was not possible using the xenograft mouse model. And so uh, uh, here, what we found was that uh, the, the B cells and the rank ligand, they are cooperating with each other to drive this bone metastasis. And how do, they, how do we see this? Because now in these MPC3 cells, we are overexpressing the rank ligand. And, uh, uh, and using the same model, we see that when we overexpress rank ligand and deplete the B cells using the CD20 antibody, we are dramatically increasing the bone metastasis as seen here, right? And then we took another approach. Uh, instead of depleting the B cells using the anti CD20 antibody, we took the genetic approach wherein uh, the, the, these mice called MUMT mice are genetically uh, uh, depleted for B cells. And using both approaches, we find that rank ligand cooperates with B cells in, uh, 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 in the manifestation of prostate cancer bone metastasis. And so we have some um, uh, idea as to how this is happening. For example, the BC, MPC3 cells that overexpress the rank ligand, they overexpress a receptor called the CXCR4. And so CXCR4 is a very interesting uh, molecule because the uh, this is a receptor and the cognate ligand is called the CXCL12. And it so happens that, uh, for example, in prostate cancer progression, there is a very strong correlation between uh, CXCR4, which is, over which is extensively known to be overexpressed in human prostate cancer cells. And the, the bone expresses a lot of CXCL12 that acts as the cognate ligand. And so there is this chemokine gradient that is established, uh, which helps in this bone metastatic process. And so um, these uh, MPC3 rank ligand cells overexpress the CXCR4. And when we looked at the bone metastatic, uh, uh, the model that I showed you, and we looked at, uh, we flushed the bones, uh, we saw that there is, a much higher expression of the CXCL12, suggesting that there is a, co a cooperation between the B cells and the rank ligand. And so uh, uh, to summarize uh, my talk, uh, we found using the xenograft mouse model that TBX2 plays a, a critical role in prostate cancer uh, multiple aspects of the, the, the uh, metastatic uh, you know, cascade, including local, meta local uh, regional uh, metastasis, um, distant metastasis, as well as the ability to grow in the bone microenvironment. Uh, we were able to find that B cells drive prostate cancer bone metastasis using a syngenic mouse model, and that uh, rank L uh, perhaps cooperates with the B cell depletion and that the bone metastasis is uh, driven by rank ligand is mediated by the CXCR4, CXCL12 signaling. So, so here is, is a schematic. Uh, so like I, I mentioned, the primary prostate cancer cells uh, express the CXCR4 and uh, the, the, the um, 
cognate ligand is the CXCL12. Uh, so what happens is uh, this uh, chemokine gradient that is established uh, helps in the homing to the bone. So for example, how do prostate cancer cells know that they have to get to the bone, right? So I, as I mentioned, there are some strategic mechanisms employed by these prostate cancer cells. And one of these is the, C, uh, is the chemokine uh, CXCL12, CXCR4. And so we think that there is a convergence in the rank, rank ligand CXCR4, CXCL12 uh, signaling in prostate cancer bone metastasis. And then we are working on the molecular mechanism of uh, how the B cell depletion uh, uh, leads to uh, prostate cancer bone metastasis. And the, the, the future goal is to create a transgenic or, the, or a genetically engineered mouse model that can replicate multiple steps of this uh, bone metastatic cascade in, in, within the context of a physiological as well as immune competent uh, uh, mouse model. So uh, here is my lab. Uh, uh, you know, any of this work would not have been possible uh, without uh, my lab members. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, TTUHSC Department of Cell Biology and Biochemistry and uh, my funding source, which is the Department of Defense Prostate Cancer Research Program, as well as all my uh, collaborators uh, in Los Angeles, um, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 in, at Vanderbilt University and my lab members. Uh, with that, uh, I think we can conclude my talk and uh, uh, perhaps we can uh, begin the, uh, the question answer session. I hope I haven't taken a lot of time. Uh, yes, Dr. Srinivas. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very exhaustive and uh, informative talk. Uh, so a lot of uh, I mean, research ideas and uh, your findings that you have presented, which were really very interesting to know about. Yeah, so thank you for uh, your excellent talk. And um, I, I could see in the chat box that uh, many of the participants have uh, highlighted uh, their uh, feedback in the sense they have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, with a great interest, they have attended all the talk and they have informed that it is very informative and very useful talk. Many of the participants have shared their views already in the chat box. So, uh, in the as we could see in the Q and A box, um, uh, Dr. Kumar has already answered a few of the questions uh, to the participants' queries. And, uh, there are a few questions in the chat box as well. Uh, uh, Professor Guru, uh, can you please uh, uh, look into the chat box? Chat box, uh, no questions, sir. Okay. We do not read patients. Uh, okay. This is the questions too. I hope uh, this is uh, Dr. Sir. Manisha Tripathi. Uh, yeah, so this is answer given, I guess, sir, uh, already. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question is uh, like, okay. Yeah, one is from Dr. P.S. Prasad. Ah, Thanks to the speakers. Yeah. yeah. However, presentations are good. Okay. However, how many terminally ill patients? have survived from third to fourth stages of cancer. And the second question is, uh, is anyone of you ever tried uh, alternative medicine? medicine? To treat cancers, what you have shared now? If not, are you interested to do clinical studies uh, by applying uh, alternate medicines? Are you interested in uh, alternate medicines? Okay, so I can uh, probably start the answer. Yeah, <laughs> the, please. I, actually, briefly, I, I answered in the chat. Uh, but uh, like, how many patients survived from stage three and stage four cancers are the terminally ill ones? So it varies from one cancer to another. We cannot just generalize. Uh, so some cancers have worse for prognosis, and some cancers has better prognosis. And you can have all of this information in the, the TCGR or the cancer statistics. Uh, uh, it's called a SEER database. Uh, for each particular cancer, you can get that information. Uh, so there are many uh, such uh, databases from, uh, from USA and also from the World Health Organization and many other sources you can get those. 
I mean, it's not uh, like you know, on top of our heads uh, to give a right answer for that. But uh, but th those are kind of informative things. We can suggest some sites if needed. Uh, the websites so you can get that information regarding the alternative medicines. So which alternative medicine particularly? And uh, so reg uh, regarding alternative medicines, there are so many different kind of alternative medicines. And uh, so there is no clear evidence uh, that they they will be beneficial for the patients compared to the. Uh, to the, the allopathic uh, treatment. So unless until we have a proof or, or, or experimental proof or clinical trial uh, proof, we cannot say. However, I cannot deny that they will not work or something, but they may be something like, you no, know, the nutrition probably is very important. And uh, some, uh, some other uh, like yoga or some other kind of uh, like, you no know, uh, healing processes. Those are all in concert with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the therapeutic that we have, we are currently doing. So they might help or they might uh, make the patient recover quickly from the uh, toxicities uh, given by the, like, you know, uh, by different kind of therapeutics the patient get. But I do not know uh, uh, any particular alternative therapy would be a better choice for particular cancer. Uh, so if there is something, I do not know. Dr. Kumar. Uh, participants, is there any other questions uh, from your end? So please uh, type in the either chat box or question and answer box. I think uh, there is a question and answer box. I think uh, I think this may be the one, Dr. Chandrasekhar ACS Reddy. Yeah. Uh, I, so I they were asking, uh, I think he was asking about, uh, you mentioned about types of cancers uh, yeah. slide. The drug, the trastuzumab, I think that's what it is, is also using used for the COVID-19 treatment in India during the clinical trials. So exactly, I do not know how many patients recover from yeah. this uh, if they are used in India. Uh, but it may be because there are, because the COVID-19, uh, uh, the symptoms are uh, like, no, very uh, like, no, serious and uh, the acute uh, responses needed. So there are different kind of uh, drugs are used and uh, the different type uh, kinds of outcomes have been there. So uh, nobody knows exactly. I think uh, we are just learning uh, more and more as the time passes, at least the we know that vaccines are uh, uh, more effective than uh, any other therapy, I think. Uh, so it's better, like, you know, there are several options for the vaccines you have. It's better to take vaccine and prevent. If, unless, unfortunately, if any patient gets uh, seriously ill, yeah, the doctors will take uh, whatever the, the, uh, the, their best choice of the uh, things based on the patient's and patient comorbidities and many other factors also. I think, you know, there are several, several cancer drugs are also used for uh, the thing, particularly to suppress the immune responses and, uh, and uh, like, you know, they are like, you know, and also the antiviral drugs and many drugs are there. So, but, you know, we cannot say uh, this unless until uh, there, there have been clinical trials and the data shows that you know, they are more beneficial than other therapies. And also, this, I think he also asked whether uh, when this drug uh, Herceptin is used, uh, whether that can prevent the cancer. And uh, that is also, it's too early to say anything because this is used for one uh, type of indication and how long that is used. And you have to have, a, again, clinical trial information for a long-term study. And you have to observe the patients. And if the people who took Herceptin as a treatment for COVID uh, and versus other treatment, uh, the people have taken. So then you have to compare and see whether there is any beneficial beneficiary effect of Herceptin when used for the COVID. So, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable uh, information. Yeah. And also, I think he also asked whether the uh, 2DG, the 2-deoxyglucose drug, and in 
mammals and in case of cancer therapy i think this is a kind of age old uh, one and uh, and i'm sure there should be wealth of information on on this uh, its anti cancer effects of course i think it might uh, show some anti cancer effects but it is not used that means probably the clinical trials uh, based on the trials data maybe they are this is may not be as effective as other drugs and so that's why probably they are not using i think but uh, i think uh, is used in the diagnostic cancer diagnostics and other kind of uh, diagnostic uh, methods the 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 labeled ones uh, for the scanning purposes and that but there are these are very yeah, uh, good questions questions okay sir i am having one question see uh, with respect to cancer in us suppose if you formulate a drug Yes. So, how much time it takes to clear the cl clinical trials? Yeah, I think uh, it takes years because based on the, the the drug and the nature of the like the type of therapy as well as uh, uh, as the the cancer like you know, the some cancers are more lethal and you may get uh, like you no know, orphan drug or like you no know, the emergency use like as we got for COVID. Uh, so, like. so yeah it could be depends but in in general i think it takes anywhere from 5 to 10 years probably it's it's a long term process because you have to look uh, like the stage 3 stage 4 in a, in, a, in a randomized clinical trial and benefits versus you have you have to compare the existing therapies versus the the, the new therapy how effective and whether it is actually reducing any toxicity uh, toxicities etc by other uh traditional therapies so the many things in one and also the well, suppose if you are developing a uh, the estrogen receptor targeting drug so it might take much longer because you have to show a lot more uh endpoints that are better than the thing because they are already effective uh, in tomax and all what is the what is the lifestyle those who are all uh, suffering from uh, prostate cancer what was uh, the question for that yeah, yeah yeah probably manish r sin was can answer yes could you repeat the question please no thing is say uh, uh, the patients who are all suffering from prostate cancer what kind of lifestyle they are leading yeah so um before and after yes. yeah so as as you probably already know that in western world a uh, prostate cancer cases are much higher as compared to uh the the other part of the world uh, and it has been um the research is still going on but it is kind of um uh we can say that um the kind of uh, western diet that he, that people have uh with uh, more fat and more meat and uh, especially i believe red meat um has uh, some correlation with with the with the disease um as compared to uh you know the more vegetarian diet uh would would rather be helpful and then um exercise there is a lot of research that is going on about uh, exercise uh, including like dr pale mentioned about uh, yoga that uh, so so lifestyle does have uh, qu quite a bit of effect especially in case of prostate cancer as you know that it is a uh, it's a sort of like an age related disease and it's a slow progressing disease so there is no, also this thing now more and more clinicians are probably looking into is weightful watching so for example because you know there is lot of side effect to the, these therapies um not not just um and sometimes the side effects might be actually uh, more harmful than that particular drug being able to cure the the disease itself um so yeah you want to add something yeah i i think you know um lifestyle is really important because one of the very seminal uh, um you know how do we know that lifestyle is important because uh, they've they've done some studies where uh, you know uh suppose countries like india or china or uh, you know asian countries uh, they are much less susceptible to prostate cancer and when these people migrate to the united states 
And if you look at these, this population of Indians or Chinese, the, the incidence of prostate cancer goes way higher. And so when you think about that, it's, it's a sort of an experiment that is very hard to do, but uh, which is very valuable. And, and so the only difference in these people is the environment and the diet, right? And so there is no question that lifestyle plays a very important role. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, there are participants, is there any other questions? Uh, then otherwise I request uh, Professor Sendir Kumar to Wrap up. Uh, our, our vice chancellor uh, would uh, like to speak, I guess. Yeah. I, uh, no problem. Uh, I just uh, say thanks to them uh, for the wonderful uh, lectures they gave. Uh, all uh, Kumaraya and uh, Kumar and uh, Manisha and uh, Srinivas. Uh, we keep touch with them and uh, we can have uh, further collaboration in academics and uh, research with our uh, university. And uh, I all these uh, lectures were very good. And uh, I saw in the chat box, and um, there are many doctors are also there. And they were uh, rising that all lectures are very informative and uh, very useful to them. And uh, it's wonderful. And I thank you very much, Kumar and uh, Srinivas and uh, Manisha for giving and helping our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also thank you all and uh, for your time and giving us the opportunity to share. Yes, and uh, my colleagues. Thank we you, really enjoyed. Yes, sir. So uh, uh, thank you all for the wonderful talk and your valuable time. And uh, we'll be definitely in touch. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, please. Uh, if, we, yeah. If, uh, if we are any help, yeah, please reach out. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Rao no, that, has, uh, no, my suggestion is uh, our contact uh, details. No, my suggestion is uh, Kumar and Srinivas and Manisha. They have to have a collaborative research with our group because Mizoram is a place where a lot of cancer patients are there. So uh -huh. it is highest prevalence of cancer in India is Mizoram. Uh -huh. So you can have sam samples from here and you can have collaborative research there and comparative analysis with your studies there. And uh, Santil and uh, Guru they, and other people in our biotechnology and zoology, they can be collaborated because uh, uh, Mizoram is an ideal place for getting samples. A lot of research is going on in um, Mizoram uh, University with Santil Kumar and the Guru and other John and other people are there really doing well. So you can also collaborate with us in uh, some kind of collaborative research activity and uh, uh, more samples can be obtained from uh, Mizoram and uh, varied types of cancers are there in uh, Mizoram. So it may be very good for uh, you to have academic collaboration uh, through this. Yeah, we actually, like we are, op we are open to this. Uh, I don't think we have any issues with that, but only thing is like, you no. Know, so uh, we uh, like you know, suggest uh, your faculty to reach out to us, uh, like and uh, then with the, with the specifics of what they are working, and uh, they can share the information, and then accordingly we can uh, we can actually go move move forward. Thank you, sir. I think I think it was a great uh, opportunity for us to to connect with mm -hmm. you all. And uh, I mean, I, I see that uh, this talk is just the beginning and how we can, uh, you know, keep the communication going and uh, hopefully collaborate with uh, uh, several professors there. These two, you can be in touch with these two people. Sentil can coordinate with uh, all people yes, and he can plan everything because he himself has got uh, many projects in cancer research. No? Uh, he's doing a lot of uh, genomic studies also in cancer research. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. he's doing uh, a lot of projects handling. Uh, and uh, I think they can connect to you and uh, in some specific um, compared to studies between uh, uh, Mizoram and other places and Mizoram and America. And uh, like that, you can have compared to analysis now because it is a highest prevalent state. It can be very good uh, uh, for uh, some kind of uh, uh, useful information to be out. Yes, yes sir. Uh, uh, thank you all once again. And uh, as uh, we were discussing, we will write the emails to you and we'll be in touch, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, good to see you. Kumar. Long time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Srinivas Manisha, thank you. Thank you, Kumar. Yeah, yeah, sure.
ఏమో ఇంకెప్పుడు అయిపోయి మా సర్వీస్ అయిపోయింది కదా ఇంకేమైనా చేయదు ఇయర్స్ రావడం కష్టం ఇంకా మీ బాబు మీ మనవాడ మనవాడు కదా అవును చాలా పిక్చర్స్ ఈజ్ వెరీ క్యూట్ ఎస్ ఎస్ ఓకే మా అబ్బాయి